everybody, I'm back from Australia and I didn't accidentally get killed. So, welcome to Dry Dock episode 254. This week, the questions are taken from guides 308 to 309, that's on HMNZS Achilles and the Lively Class Frigates, and the Wednesday videos, US Navy Fleet Problems from Fleet Problem 13 through to 16, and the Grumman F4F Wildcat collaboration with Rex's Hangar with a question or two thrown in from the learning about the French Navy book recommendations video. So let's begin. The man formerly known as commenting is what I do asks, why was having two twin turrets in an AX configuration for the primary battery in pre-dreadnoughts more popular than having three twin turrets in an AQX configuration? There are a number of reasons for this decision. Now, obviously you do have things like the Brandenburgs, which show exactly the kind of layout that you're suggesting. However, there are multiple problems with this kind of layout. One of which is that the amidships turret here has shorter guns than the fore and aft turrets, which means that the ballistics are completely out of whack if you're trying to do a combined broadside. And of course you have basically zero capability of uh, end on fire with your center turret. You can only fire on the broadside. That could be mitigated by a slightly larger design, to be fair, because uh, the Brandenburgs are slightly on the smaller side of pre-dreadnoughts for their time period. So perhaps a larger vessel would have been just slightly longer or just rearranged its superstructure such that you could get all three turrets with similar length guns. But there are considerably more problems with this kind of layout in the 1890s when the pre-dreadnought design is sort of being solidified than just slightly different lengths of uh, main gun. Firstly, obviously because of the presence of this gun turret in the image ships area, that means you have to massively cut down on the amount of secondary and tertiary guns that you possess. Now at the beginning of the pre-dreadnought period, the main battery has a rate of fire in terms of minutes per round instead of rounds per minute. So what you've done is you put in two guns that can maybe fire around every three to five minutes, depending on who, who exactly is making which ship. And you've sacrificed, you know, 30, 50, 60 percent of your secondary battery when battle strategy of the time holds that it's actually going to be the secondary battery that will suppress and damage and set fire your opponents and then you will finish them off with your main battery so you have a slightly greater capability of finishing people off but you're much much less likely to be in a position to do that in the first place because you will have been overwhelmed by massed secondary battery fire from everybody else long before the additional firepower of your third turret comes into play and Similarly, because you have a much reduced anti-torpedo boat battery for the same reason as you have a reduced secondary battery, the blast effects of that central turret, you are much, much more vulnerable to incoming torpedo craft, which is also going to be a fairly major problem because the 1890s is kind of when you start to see the first real ocean-going destroyers, torpedo boat destroyers and torpedo boats actually coming into vogue, although there have been torpedo boats and so forth around before this. So you're reducing what's essentially seen as your actual main offensive battery at the, in the early 1890s and your anti-torpedo boat battery period in exchange for guns of somewhat questionable utility, which could obviously be a problem. You've also massively increased the amount of armor that you have to put into the ship because you've got to have another fully armored turret with a fully armored barbette. And there are going to be issues with ammunition storage and your speed because obviously the magazines are going to be deep down in the ship so you can't have machinery there. If you can't have machinery there then your overall power plant is smaller therefore you can't go as quickly as some of your contemporaries. And also your machinery space is going to be quite compact which means that your machinery space is very likely to be adjacent to at least your midships magazine, possibly even your forward magazine. And that in turn is going to come with all sorts of fun insulation issues and cooling issues for the ammunition stored there. And so you end up in a situation where if you look at the Royal Sovereigns, which are sometimes called the first pre-dreadnoughts, although I tend to think the Majestics probably hold that title better, 
but the Royal Sovereigns are the immediate temporal contemporaries of the Brandenburgs. They are about the same length, believe it or not. Um, the Royal Sovereign is a few feet longer, but not by much. Um, she is, however, substantially beamier. She, the Royal Sovereign is 75 foot wide as opposed to the Brandenburg 64 foot. But given that the armament layout is mostly a product of length rather than width, because even if you did make the Brandenburgs 10 foot wider, the blast effects of the iron inch gun are still going to preclude you putting your secondary and tertiary armament in that uh, section where that turret is. In any case, the Royal Sovereign has the two twin turrets, Brandenburg has three twins for its main batteries, but the Brandenburgs then only carry six relatively small 4.1 inch or 105 millimeter guns as their secondary battery, whereas the Royal Sovereign's carrying 10 single six inch guns. And then for the anti-torpedo boat battery, the Brandenburgs have eight 88 millimeter or 3.5 inch guns. The Royal Sovereigns have a total of 22 anti-torpedo boat guns, albeit they're a mixture of the slightly smaller 57 and 47 millimeter guns, six pounders and three pounders, which kind of counterbalances the fact that they have more and heavier secondary batteries. And then they both have a slew of torpedo tubes beneath the water, but that's not really affected anywhere near as much as anything else. But Royal Sovereign is also about a knot quicker and carries thicker armor. So overall, Royal Sovereign is faster, better protected, and in terms of the battle strategy of the time, has considerably better anti-torpedo boat weaponry, considerably better standard engagement weaponry, and it's two twin turrets, okay, the 13.5 inch as opposed to 11 inch gun, so it actually probably hits about as hard as Brandenburg. So yeah, it's just not efficient and not worth it on pre-dreadnought sizes with pre-dreadnought main gun technology, at least in the early stages, to try and go for three twin turrets instead of two. And by the time you get to the latter stages of the pre-dreadnought era, i.e. you're getting to maybe 1900 onwards, and then you might begin to have some utility in having a third set of main guns because at that point main guns have now gone over two rounds per minute instead of minutes per round but by that stage you only have two or three classes of pre-dreadnought for the month on average before you actually hit dreadnoughts which kind of embrace that even more so and the secondary batteries and anti-torpedo batteries on pre-dreadnoughts have grown considerably in both number and size so you'd still be cutting into those quite a lot I mean, one of the things where Dreadnought was a bit of a dead end was that they actually cut down Dreadnought's secondary tertiary batteries, etc. Instead of Lord Nelson, which had those things, Dreadnought just had its 12-inch guns and then a relatively lightweight secondary battery for anti-torpedo boat purposes. But when you look at the Bellerophons uh, and St. Vincent's, they pretty much immediately go, actually, that's maybe going a bit too far and you get the start of what becomes the traditional secondary battery for basically the Anglo-Germans arms race and World War One era dreadnoughts. Iron Man Howe asks, I have a book called Carrier Combat, and it states that originally Karga and Akagi were very different to each other, and that one of them had one flight deck and an island, and the other one had three flight decks. This contradicts your guide to them, so I would like to know a definitive answer. Well, I'm afraid that if that is what the book says, then it is completely and utterly wrong. Um, when they were both launched in the 1920s, Akagi and Karga both, and we can prove this very easily with visual references like this, had three flight decks. So this is Akagi for reference. Now, both of them were refitted to have a single flight deck and an island of some description. However... Um, these refits did not occur until the 1930s. Karga went first, 1934 to 1935, and in fact Karga was out with her single flight deck and island just before Akagi went in for her modernization, albeit Akagi's modernization took a lot, lot longer, mostly due to financial issues. So she wasn't back on station until basically 1939. Uh, so it took three, four years for her, well, three-ish years, so she went in right at the end of 1935, to complete her modernization. 
But up until the beginning of 1934, both Agagi and Kaga had three decks like this, albeit, as I've mentioned in both of the guides, really that middle one is basically useless very, very quickly. And then from 1935 onwards, Kaga has single flight deck in Ireland, and Akagi does not. But then from 1939, they both have a single flight deck and an island. Pilot Mix asks, On a recent video from the Imperial War Museum about HMS Belfast's engine room, I saw three different telegraph displays. One showed only stop, slow, half, from full ahead and the appropriate astern. The second was the same as the first, but had the RPM displayed. And the third showed things like making smoke, stop making smoke, etc. Were all three used together or not? And in the case of the first display, how would they tell the engine room the speed desired? Having had a look through the same video, I think it's a case of different engine telegraphs in different parts of the engine room, which would need to communicate different amounts of information to and from different elements of the crew. Also, to be fair, some of the footage I think in that film is not from Belfast or a town class cruiser. I'm pretty sure I saw a vertical triple expansion engine in there at one stage. But nonetheless, if we assume that all three are engine telegraphs actually aboard Belfast, then the a telegraph like you see at the top of this picture, which is on Belfast, so this is has your um, stop, slow, half, and full ahead and astern with the RPM. Now, this is useful because this tells you generally what you want the ship to be doing, um, but also the RPM will give you, in theory, a good idea of what the speed of the ship is, assuming that other methods uh, aren't necessarily working or maybe not be useful at the time. One that doesn't have the RPM indicator is more useful for telling just telling people roughly what the ship is doing or what the ship is expected to do. So, you know, which direction everything's going to be going in, how much steam pressure is necessary, how much is going to be used in the engines, etc. Um, so it, more of a general informational dash uh, statement of intent, whereas the one with the RPM indicator gives you a lot more fine precision information about what exactly the ship is doing at this stage and therefore how long it might be before you reach the target speed. Because of course, if there's a certain amount of RPM, let's say arbitrarily 120 RPM is what you want for um, moving ahead at full, full speed, which may be, again, arbitrarily say is equivalent to 32 knots. And you can see, OK, well, it's been acknowledged that, yes, we are going to go at full speed ahead, but the current RPM indicator is only 80. Well, then that shows you that everyone is working towards that goal, but we haven't reached it yet. Whereas without the RPM indicator, it's just like, well, you know, pile on, lads, we need, we need to get up to speed. The other one that uh, you mentioned the one that shows things like making smoke, stop making smoke, etc., and also had things like telephone and gas. I think that's not strictly speaking directly connected with the basic functions of how fast are we going and in what direction. That is basically associated with all the other things that the engine could reasonably do, like you know making smoke for concealment purposes. Uh, the gas would indicate that you have to seal up the engine room to protect against poison gas attacks, which obviously were a concern when the ship was being built, um, or given the fact that if the, if the boiler room is the thing in question, you can't seal that up unless you don't want your engines to work, your boilers will go out that way otherwise, then everyone down there might have to put on some kind of gas mask or full body equipment, depending on their role and what kind of attack it is. Telephone, obviously, yeah, you know, you need to get on the phone and contact us. We have something a bit more complicated to tell you uh, and that kind of thing. So by separating out all of those functions to a separate telegraph, it means that those orders can be conveyed without confusing everybody who's trying to work towards getting the ship to go in a particular direction at a particular speed. Josh Thomas Moore asks, were there any attempts to use balloons attached to age of sail ships for reconnaissance? None that I'm aware of, and I think for pretty good reason. Firstly, age of sail ships, wooden ships, most balloons of the period needed hot air to ascend, hot air courtesy of large fires, um, 
I mean, uh, you might kind of maybe be able to use some form of trunked galley stove, but broadly speaking, ship captains are not very happy with the idea of having large fires aboard. Um, another issue is just sheer size, the amount of balloon envelope material, etc. Where are you going to store that on a ship of the line? Um, even on a first rate, you, you go, if you go and look at HMS Victory, once you've taken into account the guns, the ammunition, the crew, etc., there's not really a lot of space. And the amount of space you'd need to store just the balloon itself, let alone uh, the basket, etc., is, you know, that's pretty um, restrictive. Plus, of course, you'd then have to get it up onto deck, which would also be difficult. Well, I suppose you could bring it up through the hatches, although then you'd have to have some kind of crane or a lot of men. It'd be incredibly complicated. Then it's amidships, which has masts on either side, which is going to be a problem, which leads to yet another issue, which is where you're exactly going to launch the thing from, because while you're inflating, it's going to be bumping up against the masts and the sails and the rigging. There's no big open space to actually launch the thing from. And then assuming you could overcome all of that you then have the problem that you have a very large balloon tied to a ship which is driven by the wind. The balloon is also going to be being blown about by the wind. And that means either the balloon is going to impede the ship, or if the wind is stronger higher up, it's going to be blowing the balloon forward, which is going to entangle its mooring rope with the masts and yards. Um, or it's going to end up towing the ship if you attach the thing to the front, which may not be taking it in the direction you want it to go. And yeah, so you're now off course with a massive balloon attached to you, which is probably not what you really wanted. And then you've got to bring the thing back down again. Quite how you're going to do that um, without something breaking and or it being punctured when it hits a mast or a yard or it knocking over a mast or a yard is, yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of problems with that. Essentially, if you're going to use something as large as a balloon, whether that be a hot air balloon or one of the early hydrogen balloons launched off of a ship, you either need a ship that is so massive with masts and yards, etc., that there's a big flat open space that you could launch a massive balloon from, or you have to wait till the age of steam when you get things like Devastation and Thunderer, which don't have significant masts and yards to worry about and then you might find some open space but even then good luck finding big enough open space to launch something like this from it super minecraft gamer asks why do they call a insert number here pounder gun as is named is it because of the weight of the cannonball that determines the naming convention or something else yeah that is literally it it is the weight of the shot so a nine pounder gun fires a nine pound roughly cannonball a 24 pounder fires a 24 pound ball a 32 pounder fires a 32 pound ball etc etc and that was just an, an easy way of essentially telling people okay we have this gun this is the ammunition we need to bring along with it now from there you can have carronades which are extremely short barrel you can have short uh, guns which are longer than carronades so they're officially cannon but they are relatively short barrel versions you can have long barrel versions hence a long nine is a long barrel nine pounder which is more traditionally what you would find on most warships would be the, the longer barrel versions of guns because they don't need to be as mobile as say shore-based artillery but the number and the pounder is always related to the weight of the shot and you get that actually carries forward through time on in some navies until much much later so in world war one you still have three pounders six pounders and 12 pounders on royal navy ships even if once you get up to the slightly larger calibers like four inch and above they've now started referring to it by caliber width rather than weight of shot by poundage but then you get into world war ii and actually there are there is still a number of guns referred to by the weight of their shot, especially in the army, hence the 25 pounder small artillery piece, for example. Now, this can lead to some confusion because usually everybody uses the weight system that they are most familiar with. And back in those days, there was not a standard metric system like most of the world uses nowadays even though it was being invented in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars and as a result 
you can have guns rated ostensibly as X pound guns, but if the pound or translated into pound equivalent weight from a different nation is actually a slightly different weight period, so their pound isn't necessarily the same weight as your pound, then you can end up with situations with, with guns that sound as if they should be the same, but in fact can't take each other's ammunition. Or you can end up with guns that sound like they might be in the same ballpark of firepower as each other, but actually are quite different in shot weight. So, for example, when you look at a lot of French guns of the Napoleonic Wars and immediately after period, you have the Livre, and which is their equivalent translated into pounds for most uh, most books in the English language. And you have the 36 livre gun and the 30 livre gun, which is the more modern, re usually replacement for it. And you might look at it and go, okay, 36 French pounds, 32 English pounds. So their shot weight is a uh, within four pounds of each other. Near enough as it makes no difference. It's just a heavy gun. But then you have to account for the fact that the French livre is slightly heavier than the English pound, which actually makes the 36 livre gun broadly more competitive to the 42 pounder British gun, which they'd actually taken out of service, partly because you could get more 32 pounders for a similar amount of weight, and partly because it was just really difficult to manhandle a uh, shot of that weight class in open seas. Manius Curious asks, during the fleet problem period, either the 1920s and 30s, why was the US still practicing for a war with the UK? Were there tensions between the powers that I'm not aware of? There was a mixture of factors in the US decision. Partly it was because a lot of the fleet problems rather specifically targeted Japan and the Japanese were getting a little bit annoyed about that, making all sorts of diplomatic protests. So uh, it made a nice change to simulate a war game against someone who very clearly was not Japan. Then you also have the fact that the Royal Navy was on paper as large as the US Navy, um, and the US Navy and the Royal Navy is being the largest navies on the planet. In practice, the Royal Navy, for good chunks of the fleet problem period, i.e. the interwar period, was actually maybe a fraction larger. But either way, if you conformed all your battle tactics around the idea of, theoretically, you would have a superiority in numbers, which is what battle tactics against Japan would um, in, would give you, then it would leave you with a very big gap in your technical knowledge, i.e. what do we do if we're fighting outnumbered or on an equal par, which might end up happening, even if you are planning on fighting Japan, if they catch you on the back foot, say you're there, they've rigged their fleet to be completely ready for war and they catch you, let's say, as, we, as with one of the exercises, if, if they manage to blow the Panama Canal and you're suddenly fighting on an even footing or even worse outnumbered, if you have no experience pre-war in your exercises how to fight someone on that level, then you could be in a lot of trouble. So by simulating an engagement against the Royal Navy, which plausibly could show up with equal or greater numbers than you, that means that your fleet is ready for anything. And then finally, yes, there were some political tensions with the UK in the 1920s and 1930s. A lot of that came from the fact that the British Empire, which obviously going into World War One had been pretty much unchallenged as far as sheer size of navy on the seas, on the high seas, and at very especially you know, comparative strength of the Royal Navy and the US Navy, there was no, no real argument. To in the post-war environment, the US initially trying to claim dominance of the seas, then settling that thanks to a change of government in large part for the Washington Treaty to parity. And the Royal Navy, obviously, and the British Empire as a whole, looking at the US and thinking, are they going to try and displace us? We're not necessarily sure we like this. The US looking at the British Empire going, oh, we want to displace them, but uh, are they going to accept that without a fight, etc.? And clashes over mutual interests. So, yeah, there was a certain degree of tension. And in actual fact, if you have the two volumes set by Stephen Roskill, Naval Policy Between the Wars, Volume 1, which is 1919 to 1929, is actually titled The Period of Anglo-American Antagonism. It, it kind of settled down by the 1930s to a certain extent, but 
yeah, certainly in the first half of the interwar period, there was a fair degree of concern, not necessarily that you would easily end up at war with the British Empire and thus the Royal Navy, but it definitely wasn't out of the question. Tenemark asks, to what extent were international observers present at these fleet problem exercises? The degree of international observers at any given fleet problem varied quite a bit, as you would have got from the series in general. Early on, the fleet problems were seen as much as a showcase to the general public and to the wider audience internationally as they were actual you know, fleet exercises, at which point international observers in the press would be present quite a lot. The presence of international observers aboard the actual US Navy ships, as in, you know, serving naval officers. That could vary depending on, you know, who was available, etc. And occasionally foreign warships were known to show up to view at least part of the exercises. But the flip side to that is that the exercises are usually quite high intensity and involve traversing over large distances, which would mean that uh, a foreign warship that wanted to observe a good chunk of a fleet problem would be running themselves quite ragged, getting all over the place, trying to figure out where the US fleet had gone, because of course they're under no obligation to tell you where they're going, especially at night, um, which would complicate things quite a bit. So a foreign warship might observe part of an exercise, but it's very unlikely to observe the entire exercise. And then as time goes on through the 1920s and then into the 1930s, as the US Navy gets more and more secretive, then invites to observe to foreign uh, naval officers aboard US warships would become less and less. And you see towards the very end of the 1930s, they're completely closed off to everyone. They're very much in-shop exercises. And although the US Navy has ostensibly restarted the fleet problems uh, in this century, They've you know carried on that trend to the point that I think pretty much most of the results of the fleet problems, as far as I know, are probably still under some form of restriction or classification. Charles Toast asks, I guess none of these exercises highlighted the weakness of US Navy crew deployment policy with a significant difference between the locations of their action stations and duty positions and accommodation. Were the superior policies of enemy fleets in that regard simulated in the ships posing as enemy forces, or were the US simply oblivious to these policies? If the enemy forces in the exercises had simulated the improved policies, would it have affected the results much? Well, this actually highlights perfectly one of the problems with doing exercises against yourself, which is that if you collectively as an organisation have blind spots, exercising against yourself is very unlikely to highlight those blind spots which can then lead to problems in the future. And that's not a problem that was exclusive to the interwar period. It's to a certain extent still even going on to the to this day. So there is no evidence that I can see that the US Navy either was particularly aware of or particularly cared about the duty versus action station versus accommodation positioning of crew in other navies. Um, certainly they didn't seem to find the at Guadalcanal for Savo Island, etc., when a Royal Australian Navy vessels, and then later in the broader Pacific area, the Royal Australian and Royal Navy vessels were able to get to action stations far quicker than their own ships. They were sort of looked at it and went, Oh, that seems like a good idea. We should probably copy that, which, apart from anything, very strongly indicates that this issue did not come up during the fleet problems. And yeah, that correlates with the fact that no real mention of these things is made in the fleet problems. Because, of course, if both sides are using the same way of getting to action stations versus their duty stations, then they're all going to come on online and ready to fight at roughly the same time, which suggests an approximate parity, which means if you think you've already got best practice and then you think, oh, therefore I'm simulating the enemy having best practice. And so you're not going to be looking out for anything better than that. If such a thing had been known and it had been implemented in the opposition forces, then yes, it probably would have affected results and it almost certainly would have led to a change in US fleet practice. Because whilst 
some of the larger engagements, the, the big fleet battles and so forth that were fought across various fleet problems, you know, those things from the time that everybody is sighted and everybody starts heading to action stations compared to when the fighting itself actually begins, yeah, that's probably long enough that everybody can get get with the program and be ready. Whereas some of the other actions, specifically when people are stumbling across each other or there's night actions and kind of unexpected engagements, in those circumstances, the difference between being able to come to action stations in a few minutes versus 10 to 15 could make all the difference in when you can open fire. Now, of course, the slight issue there would be convincing the umpires that you are in fact action stations at that point and have begun to open fire which could be a problem because again you know the the implicit bias of thinking that you're already got best practice if the umpire's like oh no well we don't actually believe that you could do that well then you're a bit stuffed but you know you i think if the umpires had been working as intended and someone had simulated say royal australian or royal navy practice and gotten a lot of good results as a result of that in the meeting engagements then the the u.s navy probably would have changed its, its policy on where the crews were supposed to be stationed fairly quickly jb76489 asks how was the ammunition for anti-aircraft guns safely stored or distributed on ships particularly for the guns that were tacked on after the fact and not part of the original design there were effectively four stages of ammunition storage for such guns, um, particularly when you're talking about 20mm and 40mm, the Orlikans and Bofors, which seems to be largely what you're aiming for. Um, and that is that you would have storage for these t guns' ammunition in converted magazines deep down in the ship. Sometimes those would be magazines deep down that had been converted out of storerooms. Sometimes they would be repurposed magazines if other guns had been removed. So, for example, if you were on a, uh, a an old US standard and they'd taken away all of the 5-inch um, 51s, then the 5-inch 51 magazines, some of them would have been converted to 5-inch 38 magazines, but one or two might be allocated for 20mm or 40mm ammo storage. And likewise, you know, with a Queen Elizabeth class, say Queen Elizabeth or Valiant, that's been modernised, or Renown for that matter, the 4-inch in the case of Renown, or 6-inch in the case of QE and Valiant magazines, would have been repurposed to 4.5-inch AA magazines, but there might be one or two leftover spare. Or, in some cases, you might have entire compartments converted to take that, and then you ha add additional storage for your 40mm and 20mm shells via converted compartments like I just described. For example, um, Hood, when she's launched, has a small 4-inch uh, magazine for her limited anti-aircraft supplies, but she also has 5.5-inch magazines. But by the time of her loss at the Battle of Denmark Strait, the those have been at least at the aft end have been combined and have also taken over a couple of other nearby storage areas into larger four inch dedicated AA magazines. So that's your deep storage. But then when you're talking about the the lighter guns, the twenty mils, the forty mils, the ten ones that tend to be just slapped on after the fact, you would then have clipping rooms, uh, as they're known in the US fleet, which are higher up, usually either in the superstructure or possibly in the first deck or so in the hull itself, depending on the ship in question. And those rooms would turn the, if you like, the raw ammunition into the, in case of the Bofors, the clips of four rounds, you can see with one of them being uh, manhandled between the two pairs of guns here, or into the drums for the 20mm Orlikans. So those would all be assembled there and that would act as a kind of a secondary storage um so which is much closer to the aa guns then in the immediate proximity of the anti-aircraft guns there would be ready use lockers which are somewhat sealed and protected um not against direct hits or even particularly heavy splinters but you know the odd stray round the odd pinging splinter it would preserve them from and though then you would also have obviously the ammunition that's stored in, on, or around the gun mounting. Now, for a 20mm Orlikan, that may just consist of 
if you're on air raid warning, that may consist of just a single uh, drum of 20 millimeter rounds locked into the gun, ready to go. If it's 40 mil bofors, you'd have multiple racks of multiple clips within the mounting, uh, which you can see when you go to pretty much any museum ship that has a 40 millimeter anti-aircraft emplacement. And so once the guns start up, they will burn through the ammunition that they've immediately got to hand, and they'll be members of the gun crew or the ship's crew running ammunition from the ready use lockers, which might be only a couple of feet away. They might be 10, 15 feet away, but they'll be running that ammunition to the guns. And there will be more people running ammunition from the clipping room to either to the ready use lockers or to the position where the ready use lockers are to pass it on to the men who are passing it forward onto the guns. And there will be people bringing up ammunition from the deep magazines as well. So you can sometimes find changes to the ship in terms of hatches or holding areas that have either been installed or had additional latches put on to hold them open, which, you know, may not necessarily have either been there in the first place or may not have been used for the passage of ammunition previously, but they've been adapted to allow for quick and easy passage of ammunition up. And some of that maybe clips and drums that have been pre-prepared and set by the clipping room and sent back down in quieter times. And some of it might just be raw ammunition, which is being fed up to the clipping room, which will then be fed up as described previously. Fortunately, the fact that this stuff is usually cased and relatively small compared to 4 inch, 4.5 inch, 5 inch, or 6, 8 inch, 14 inch, 16 inch, etc. means that it's relatively speaking difficult to set off the propellant charges for these kinds of anti-aircraft guns and of course the charges themselves are relatively small so a clipping room being hit by a shell or a bomb poses a far smaller risk to the integrity of the ship than a four inch 4.5 inch or four or a five inch magazine or handling room which in turn obviously is less of a risk compared to the main gun magazines Mountain Board Wales asks, was cross-deck firing ever used in action? Did any of the dreadnoughts or battle cruisers with staggered wing turrets fire a full salvo in anger? Yes, whilst in peacetime it became very rapidly apparent that the amount of superficial damage that could be caused by cross-deck firing was usually more trouble than it was worth for regular gunnery exercises, and thus cross-deck firing was very limited in peacetime. Um, but in wartime, nobody really cared about minor bits of damage as compared to getting potentially up to a quarter of your main battery into action. So cross-deck firing was very definitely done where it was possible, obviously where the arcs of fire allowed for it, um, to the extent that in several memoirs from different people, both on German and British ships, uh, one from HMS Invincible's crew is quite enlightening for the Battle of the Falkland Islands, for example. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of friendly, verging on slightly resentful um, writing from crews in cross-deck firing turrets where they're basically saying, yeah, it, it's all well and good for the... Uh, the guys who are behind us relative to the enemy are doing their cross-deck firing. They get to shoot at the enemy. We have to put up with a gun blast shaking us around inside our own turret. And the reason I refer to Invincible's account particularly is because at one point everything flips around and the crew are like, aha, well, now it's time for you guys to get a taste of what it's been like for the past half hour or so <laughs> while you've been shattering our eardrums. So yes, cross-deck firing in wartime was actually relatively common as long as they could bring the guns to bear, even if it wasn't necessarily the world's most pleasant experience for most people involved. Tim Engine Man the Second asks, I have an excellent book for capital ships, Battleships and Battle Cruises 1905 to 1970 by Secret Brea. Is there any similar book for aircraft carriers and or cruisers, even if it's divided into heavy and armoured cruisers or light and protected cruisers? These kind of large sort of cover everything encyclopedic books are a little bit difficult, I think, to strike a balance with, because if you cover everything, you by necessity don't cover anything in massive detail. Um, obviously, Brer's book is pretty good. Um, given how old it is now, there are some parts of it that are a bit outdated because more information has come forward, but it's, it's an okay foundational book. Um, 
to start with. Uh, basically, you know, the stuff that the, the, the ships that are relatively uncontroversial are usually perfectly fine. But when you get to the ships that people are still having arguments about, um, there's usually a bit more information out there these days. Nonetheless, if you want something for aircraft carriers, probably the closest one that had is a, of a similar thing covering everybody's aircraft carriers would be the one you can see on screen aircraft carriers of the world 1914 to the present an illustrated encyclopedia by Ro roger chesno that's pretty good um as far as cruisers are concerned you run into the problem of just there's so many cruisers i'm not aware of anything that does either chesno or brayer levels of detail across the board um Bernard Island's done an encyclop the World Encyclopedia of Cruisers, um, which at one point I had a copy of, but it yeah, you know, it it because of the sheer number of ships that it had to cover, um, and I think even then it missed a few, it just didn't have anything like the level of detail of the other two, so I wouldn't necessarily put it on the same pedestal. And I think you can see the problem when you look at, say, um, just British Cruisers of World War II by Raven and Roberts is in and of itself a tome almost the equal of Breyer's in length. Um, Norman Friedman's divided his into British Cruisers of Victorian era and then British Cruisers um, basically after that. US Cruisers, despite the fact the US really doesn't have that many until pretty much the interwar period. You know, that has its entire own entire Friedman book, obviously, um, the development of, of US Navy cruisers. So I think unless somebody wanted to pen something, well, I was going to say, unless someone wanted to pen something the size of Japanese cruisers of the Pacific War, then you're not going to get a book like that. But then Japanese cruisers of the Pacific War exists. It is a Bre actually larger than Brea sized tome. And as the title suggests, that's only covering essentially Japanese cruisers that were around in World War II, let alone anything else. So, yeah, and, and yeah, don't even go there with destroyers or something like that. If someone could come up with a Brea Chesno style encyclopedia, probably, as you suggest, having to divide it up into protected cruisers, light cruisers, armoured cruisers, and heavy cruisers, that would be fantastic, but it would be an absolutely mammoth work, and obviously a f like either a two- or four-volume set. Joao Rita asks, Coastal torpedo batteries. Apart from the spectacular success of the Norwegian battery versus Blucha, are there any reports of other batteries being used to great success? As far as I'm aware, I think this is the only example of straw based torpedo batteries being used to any great success mostly because if you remember the Oscar Borg Fortress torpedo launchers were really old you know they're 18 late 1800s era batteries and that's really when most straw based torpedo batteries were installed in the late 1800s and they're mostly taken out during the 1900s early 1910s because they're no longer viewed as it being particularly effective due to advances in technology and issues with the torpedoes themselves, because for the shore-based launchers, although the Norwegian ones uh, were straight runners, a lot of initial torpedo batteries were actually wire-guided, but the wire guns couldn't go so far, and it was much easier to spot the little visual cues that were needed for the people who were guiding the torpedoes from the shore from a ship with later um later vessels and of course you have that whole gunnery revolution that i've mentioned extensively before in the 1900s which allows ships to be very much further away from shore batteries than the torpedoes can reach the reason that they hung around in norway for so long was partly because it would just cost money to take them out because they were quite heavily built into the fortress but also the Norwegian fjords afford a somewhat unique defensive scenario in that you have some very deep but very confined waters. So you might well end up with very large ships having to manoeuvre at very close range down very confined areas, which means they're still vulnerable to comparatively short-range torpedo launchers, as Bluka kind of proved. So, yeah, as, unless I've missed something slightly obscure... I don't think there's any other cases of short based torpedo launchers in the time the channel covers being used with any particular success, although there were efforts to install newer short based torpedo launchers at various points after the 1900s, even up into World War II in certain areas.
Bob Hedges asks, Much is said of the thickness of armour belts along the sides of ships, but as torpedoes became more capable and the probability of explosions directly under the keel increased, I was wondering about the thickness of plate and protection, if any, on the underside of warships. Was this considered a threat to be designed around at any point during the period the channel covers, and if so, how was it dealt with? During the period the channel covers, the vast majority of underwater threats, whether they be torpedo mines or shells that go underwater, were threats to the sides of vessels. Destinations directly underneath the vessel were much more limited. They tended to come in with the advent of magnetic fuses, and even then, um, even when you had magnetic fuses and magnetic detonators, they weren't universal in, say, World War II. Now, with that said, just talking about the general below waterline areas of warships, although some defense systems did incorporate armor plate of some description, usually it's not seen as a particularly good thing unless you're talking about some kind of relatively thin armored bulkhead right at the back of it to catch any splinters. And the reason for that is actually physics. So if you have a warhead, whether that be a torpedo, a minor shell, whatever, and it's detonating in contact with the hull of the ship, when you consider the environment that detonation is taking place in, all around it is water, and for the purposes of this discussion, water is effectively incompressible. The steel, however, whilst it's very strong, especially if it's in the form of a thick armour plate, can be bent, and the area behind it is air, and that's very, very compressible. Um, so there's not a huge amount of support. So when the explosion, which you know, all explosions will try and take the path of least resistance, when the explosion occurs, the path of least resistance is into the ship, no matter to a reasonable degree how thick that plate is. At which point, yes, in theory, having a very thick armour plate much lower down in the ship might protect you from a torpedo explosion. But once you get up to hundreds or of pounds or possibly even over a thousand pounds of uh, explosive, it's not even at that point necessarily the fact of, you know, breaking the plate itself. It's also the fact the explosion will probably just rip the plate off of the support beams, etc., that it's attached to and then chuck it and bits of other parts of the ship into the ship. Um, essentially, if you're resisting an underwater explosion, you actually don't want rigid, hard protection. Uh, what you want is a multi-layered system that will absorb the e energy of the explosion gradually and dissipate it, which is what the uh, liquid void liquid or void liquid void, depending on who's setting up the system, multiple layers of bulkheads used. Then you have some of the um, attempts to do more clever get-arounds like the Italian Pugliese system or the crush tubes in HMS Hood's bulges. But essentially, it's all about using up and dissipating the energy of the explosion in some kind of sacrificial layer before you get to the hull itself. And if you see a picture of some of the Italian battleships under construction you actually see their hull low down is actually really small compared to the overall beam because the Pugliese system takes up a huge amount of space and that applies whether it's a side attack or an under the keel attack so there's usually as I said not going to be any particular thickness of plate the protection is going to be multi-layer systems now un directly under the ship as opposed to on the side you do have a degree of protection. You have what are called double bottoms or sometimes even triple bottoms, which, as the name suggests, is essentially multiple layers of hull plating spaced out so that if one is breached, then the next one theoretically isn't, which kind of works like a very, very minimal version of a standard torpedo protection system from the Second World War but it is of necessity relatively thin and nowhere near as capable. So it might mitigate the effects very slightly, but it's not usually going to do all that much, especially considering the water hammer effect and everything you get from di explosions directly underneath. So unfortunately, when it comes to dealing with underwater explosions, 
against the side you can put a certain degree of protection in although of course it becomes a race between bigger warheads and more powerful explosives versus the increasing defenses mounted on the sides of the ship but underneath the ship I'm afraid there's not really a huge amount you can do other than just be incredibly large compared to the torpedo detonation. Christian B asks, Optical rangefinders appear to be very fragile. However, we only hear about radar systems failing from shock, not mechanical rangefinders. Why? Essentially because although rangefinders are made up of glass and lenses, um, prisms, and some relatively fine mechanical actuated parts, they're actually fairly sturdy. Um, partly because they're contained usually in big metal tubes, which are then contained in big metal casings. And as you can see here with Iowa's forward turret, also um, contained for the most part within a very big heavily armored turret. Although the ones up top tend to be less armored, they are still usually encased for the most part, again, in some kind of mounting. And just being encased in some kind of mounting usually protects them to a fair degree from shock because shock waves, if they hit a relatively solid surface for them to be for that shock to be substantially transmitted inside where it could theoretically do damage to a lot of the moving parts of a rangefinder it either has to deform the casing or it's going to be mostly reflected back off of it and the individual components that make up a rangefinder are still made of fairly thick glass and fairly substantial strong metals which means that you have to hit them with a fair bit of shock to make them break Whereas the components of early radar, you've got electrical cables, which are vulnerable to shock in and of itself. They're vulnerable to shock damage, potentially severing them as well. They're relatively light. Um, and even if you've got thicker cables, the components, you know, vacuum tubes, triodes, that kind of stuff, also tend to be made of much thinner glass than most of the components for rangefinders and are obviously therefore more vulnerable. Also, rangefinders like this one, especially in a turret, they don't need to transmit their data very far. And indeed, the method of that transmission can also be fairly secure. Whereas with radar, if it's transmitting its signals via electrical cables, then obviously those cables have to run from where the radar is, high up in the ship, usually all the way down. And all of that length is therefore also vulnerable to shock. And then the radar itself, usually being made up of relatively delicate aerials and so forth, can be bent out of shape by shock or potentially severed or warped by shrapnel that's propelled by the shockwave. So essentially, radar is a lot more fragile than rangefinders. Rangefinders are, yes, some of the more delicate components of a battleship, but considering that most of the components of a battleship are made up of steel that's measured in uh, inches of terms of thickness you'd be surprised just how much of a battering a rangefinder can actually take now of course there is a sort of gray area in there where a rangefinder may be physically intact and usable but maybe slightly knocked out of alignment um, but that can be corrected and that's one of the reasons why you have multiple rangefinders brian stevens asks how did various militaries in world war ii develop their naval war games for study were these extrapolations from 19th century games for land warfare, or did they come up with something new? Unfortunately, it's a question with as many answers as there were war games that were used. I mean, back at the beginning of the 20th century, Jane's Fighting Ships actually started out as the reference guide and manual for a naval war game system that Fred T. Jane wanted people to adopt, and indeed, variants of his system were adopted and used in naval war games going forwards. But different nations developed their own styles of war games and often had multiple styles of war games. So the kind of um, what you might imagine as a, a war game as we would imagine it generally, i.e. little miniatures on a table with people moving them around up to certain distances and rolling dice to determine outcomes, that is actually genuinely done, uh, or at least was genuinely done um, back in the day. But you also had war games that were a bit more like um, combative essay writing, <laughs> where essentially a scenario would be written up and someone would write up how they would respond to it. And then an impartial 
theoretically board would judge the outcomes, pass some of that information on to the other side, who would then write up how they respond to that and so on and so forth, a bit like dueling banjos, but with more paperwork. Um, and then you also had various systems that went from there and obviously you know at the upper end you have a full-scale actual real-life fleet exercise but in between that you had various systems that tried to introduce elements of more realistic play um, things like time limits or limited visuals um, some of the notes from the national archives and some of the war games that the royal navy used actually form the basis of the adaptations that i put into the general quarter system for the war games that i used to do prior to uh, covid for example and you can see in the picture here this is the watu war games um and in this they are obviously simulating submarine and anti-submarine exercises and here it's less about the board although the board the floor i guess at this point does actually physically exist but you have all these screens and lenses and filters and so forth which are designed to actually physically simulate what you could see as the commander of the submarine or the commander of the anti-sub escort and then the orders that you were given were actually considerably more real and obviously you needed a larger staff not only of people generally but people who understood what those orders would do and how that would work in order to correctly simulate things so there's all sorts of stuff. There's a few war games that were, you know, taking land-based stuff and transposing it with slightly different rules for the sea. Um, but as I said, every every navy would have at least three or four different war gaming systems for different types of analysis, and often more. And they were constantly evolving. Ferrata Victrix asks: Are there equivalents of Hobart's funnies that were used by the Allied navies of World War Two? And if you were to design one to fulfill a need, what would it be and how would it work? So obviously Hobart's Funny is a bunch of combat vehicles, mostly tanks, that have been specifically modified to do very niche roles. You know, the famous dustbin charge launchers, uh, tanks for engineering grade demolitions, the flail tanks, even the flamethrower tanks to a certain degree. So in that respect of vessels very specifically kitted out for very specific purposes that are very obviously different from everything else and perhaps compromise some or all of their combat capability in other respects uh, in certain circumstances there's not really ships like that um there are a few attempts at things like that so there's kind of the the radar picket destroyers but i mean radar picket is a role but there were attempts to actually make full-on radar picket destroyers with considerably greater radar fits at the expense of armament um there were attempts to make destroyers even better at scouting by believe it or not sticking a scout plane and launcher on a destroyer again at the expense of armament but most of the the thing is most of the niche roles in in naval terms usually involve finding some unusual way of blowing something sky high so a lot of the things that would be broadly equivalent in terms of, you know we need to breach this very specific thing which a normal vehicle would not be able to tend to be kind of sacrificial things so that's why Campbelltown's being shown that would technically be a variant um, obviously the ships they Navy Royal Navy used in World War One to try and block the Zeebrugge Harbour would be another. Um, then you've got perhaps some of the Japanese army vessels. You know the things that are effectively your LP. They're they're trying to be what would we would now call an LPD dash light aircraft carrier like the Akitsu Maru. But the thing is, normally, if you needed some kind of specialist equipment to do a very specific task that most of the existing fleet couldn't do, then ships are usually large enough you can find somewhere to stick it on. So, you know, radar was developed. They found ways of sticking radar on ships. Uh, sonar or Aztec was developed. They found ways of putting those on ships. Paravanes were developed. They put those on ships. Hedgehog launchers, etc., etc. Because ships are just so much larger than tanks, instead of having to fit a very, very specific bit of tech to a specific vessel, usually new specific tech, tech that may only be used in certain circumstances, was just stuck on somewhere on the ship. 
Perhaps the anti-aircraft cruiser conversions would be maybe the closest to a reusable ver version that you would see in uh, Navy as opposed to on land, or something like Kitakami. I think if I was in charge of developing any kind of Hobart's funny style ship or vessel, I would probably develop one for landing, and I would probably call it the Mobile Oppression Palace just for fun, because back at the Gallipoli landings in World War One, there was an idea they converted a freighter to basically have a bunch of guns and machine guns in an armoured conversion of the bow, which was designed to provide fire support for the troops as they went ashore. Um, it kind of worked for a little bit and then didn't really so much. But personally, I think the idea in principle has a certain degree of merit. So if it was up to me, I would design something with a very wide almost raft-like hull, so it would have an extremely shallow draft as a result, and most of that hull would probably be made up of bulges. And then on top of that, I would probably be using a bunch of older spare guns, because you don't need the range uh, for this kind of use. I would build, quite literally, just a big armoured citadel. So, um, you know, steel frame, probably then with reinforced concrete um poured around it with obviously the ammunition, magazines, the guns, etc. all inside. And then on top of that, on the outside, you put proper naval grade hardened armor plate uh, backed by wood for shock absorption. So you make this thing essentially like a miniature citadel of a battleship with tons of gun ports, almost like a central battery of an ironclad, but take without the rest of the ironclad attached. Um, obviously, you can make the aft section... Um, some not necessarily open, but able to you know get people on and off ammunition on and off um, by resupply boats, etc. It doesn't have to be 360 degree armed. Uh, but the idea of this would be it would either be unpowered, unpowered or and towed or very minimally powered, but you'd bring it across to landing sites and then you would essentially drive it up onto the beach um, at speed, get it stuck fast. And then, I mean, you probably need some kind of little deployable legs to make sure it's on an even keel when it when it sticks into the sand. But the idea is then it's effectively a small, self-contained, heavily armed strong point to provide an awful lot of firepower, both you know machine guns, mortars, artillery, etc., for the troops. And it's heavily protected enough that even though it's stationary, return fire from most of the coastal defences is unlikely to do much to it because. The idea would be it'd be heavily protected enough that only like you know the the big eight inch up coastal defences could actually hurt it. But if you're putting these things ashore on the beaches along with the troops, it's unlikely those batteries are going to be able to range in on them. And if they are, well, that's what your offshore support battleships are for. Um, whereas everything smaller, you know, light field artillery that's usually good at suppressing incoming landing troops, this thing can deal with it. Jeffs Holloway asks. After seeing a short story that was shared to me, I was wondering if you could relate the story of Judy, the mascot of HMS Grasshopper, listed as the only canine prisoner of war. What happened to her? Was she liberated at war's end? Well, her story is recorded in quite a lot of detail, um, so I can only give a very brief, brief pricey version. Um, but Judy, as you can see here in sort of her about a third of the way through her life, she started her career in the Navy aboard gunboats in the far, on the Far East, aboard HMS Nat, originally in 1936. Um, as with many Royal Navy vessels, she was the mascot of the ship. And it, the in early war period, well, the, before the war, there wasn't really a huge amount that um, is known about what she did at that point. Um, she was pretty good at obviously keeping the ship clean of vermin and um, pointing out using her superior sense of hearing when something was about to happen, which was quite useful. But later on, she was put on another gunboat, the Grasshopper. And in 1942, Grasshopper, along with HMS Dragonfly, were attacked and sunk by Japanese aircraft. Um, Judy survived along with a bunch of the crew. She was then found with the crew um, where they ended up on an island. The island had no water, so everyone was thirsty, um, but 
presumably at that point using her nose, she went and found an underground water supply and managed to then dig most of it away, obviously <laughs> using her paws at that point. And so everybody's lives were saved a second time by the fact that she found them water. Unfortunately, she and the survivors of the two gunboats were then captured by the Japanese, and she would spend most of World War II in a series of Japanese prison camps, uh, keeping the morale up of the men and uh, distracting the Japanese guards when they tried to punish the men, but also the men reciprocated by distracting the Japanese guards whenever they tried to shoot her, which happened with a distressing degree of regularity. The Japanese didn't think all that much of a dog. Um, then she was on a transport ship full of prisoners, which was then accidentally, tor well, it was deliberately torpedoed, but kind of accidentally because they didn't realise it was full of prisoners. Um, but she survived that. Um, th then the Japanese ship that rescued the survivors declared, um, well, we don't like dogs. She shouldn't have been on the ship anyway, so we're going to kill her when she gets on back to land. Um, but weirdly enough, a uh, Japanese officer who'd then taken a liking to her intervened and saved her life. She then stayed with the rest of the men through, as I said, to the rest of the war. She was liberated at the end of the war. Uh, she was given the Dickin Medal, which is the animal equivalent of the Victoria Cross. And um, she then dis was, was retired from naval service, although she was listed as a prisoner of war uh, by the said officer who rescued her from being shot by the ship's crew, the Japanese ship's crew. Um, he saved her basically by officially listing her as a prisoner of war, which meant that theoretically she shouldn't be executed, um, although prisoner of war status didn't necessarily stop the Japanese from randomly executing prisoners of war. So, you know, it was a notional protection at best. Um, but she retired with Frank Williams, who was one of the prisoners in the camp, and she actually lived a surprisingly long time. She died in February 1960, which means that given she started her service on HMS Nat in 1936, she was at least 24 when she passed away. So she had a good long life um, after the war as well. And that brings us to the end of this week's Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening and uh, hope to see you again in another video shortly. We have a lot of good content coming up. So uh, see you again probably on Wednesday.